Uh, so now, as we, as we turn toward our text this morning, please be reminded that our theme for this year has been joining in the ministry with Christ. We've talked about the legitimacy of our faith being the fact that Jesus Christ not only lived and died, but he lives. He's resurrected. The motivation of our ministry must be his love. The result of this is the captivation of the grace of his peace in our own lives. And the ministry of peace and reconciliation through our lives. The truth remains that for me to be a person of peace, I must be one at peace. Likewise, for me to be a minister with Christ, I must be a disciple of Christ. Part of the significance of the Christmas holiday season, and the word holiday is a conjunctioning of two words, holy day. So the, 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 the significance of this holy season is that the themes of Christmas are the themes of the gospel. Generosity, worship, salvation, redemption, miraculous grace, miracle, miraculous transformation, and of course, peace. These things that we associate with Christmas are not by accident associated with Christmas because Christmas is the incarnation of the gospel. Literally, God became a man. And so these themes surround our hearts and surround our lives. And so at the beginning of the Christmas season, it always affords us an opportunity to reset the spiritual table, to reset our focus and set our eyes again on an appreciation of the simplicity of a babe in a manger, but the majesty of God incarnated. And so to this end, I want us to consider the record of that first Christmas recorded by Luke in his gospel account. And then I want us to look at an exhortation by King David in the 34th Psalm. So beginning in Luke, the second chapter, I'm going to be reading from the uh, King James 21st century translation this morning. It'll be on the screen and it's in your notes. And there were in the same country, beginning in verse 8, I'm sorry, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. Say those two words with me, please. Fear not. Say it again. Fear not. Peace is the absence of fear. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger." And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Read that verse aloud together with me, please. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass when the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Now in the 34th Psalm, David had written this Psalm after he had, uh, the Lord had provided an escape for him from Saul. And in Psalm 34, verse 3, he cried out, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Would you please read verse 3 aloud together with me again? Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Father, again, we thank you for your word. Grant to us the grace of your presence and the grace of your anointing. 
Grant that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Grant, Lord, that the things that I say would be what you're saying, not my opinion, not my necessary thoughts, but, Lord, what your Spirit is saying to us today. For these are your people. These are the sheep of your pasture. They need to hear your voice. Grant this grace, I ask, in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said together, amen and amen. We're going to the Lord's table today as we do the beginning of each month, but also as we do the beginning of the Christmas season. In fact, the academy students will be going to the Lord's table at chapel this Wednesday. It's an important element to remind us of things that are vital. See, if I, if I lose my finger, it's painful, it's harmful, it'll bother me. There'll be some things I won't be able to do, but with proper treatment and stopping of the blood flow and everything else, I can live. I, um, I can live a productive life and go on and, and, uh, and, and be fine. If I lose my liver, that's a different thing. That's vital. Something that is on the fringes isn't vital, but something that's at the core is vital. Christmas and Easter are vital to our faith, not just as days on a calendar, because that's, that's days on a calendar, not just as the pageantry, as beautiful as all that is, that's, that's fine, but they're vital to our faith because they speak to things that are vital. They're speaking to the gospel. God became a human being and set foot on the stage of human history. God became incarnated. Christ came to the earth. Jesus was born. Jesus lived. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. You can argue about when he's returning. That's not vital. You can argue about pre, mid, post. That's not vital. It's important to me, but it's not vital. You can argue about premillennialism, postmillennialism, ah, millennialism. You can argue all sorts of things. That's fine. You can, you can argue whether we should have churches that look like this, or you can argue whether they should look like, like a warehouse, or you can argue whether they should just be in a house. That's fine. It's not vital. It's not vital. You can argue over all sorts of different manifestations of the Spirit and things of this nature. That's fine, but that's not vital. Who Jesus is, what he de did, and what he's doing, these are vital. Christmas affords us a time to consider the vitality of our faith. And this morning, I want us to, to begin a discussion about three simple elements of faith that are intrinsically interwoven, and not by accident, by the way, into the Christmas Holy Day. In fact, these simple elements are so important to us that I don't feel that we can even live fulfilling and fruitful lives as children of God if we don't understand these three things. So please read with me again verse 14 out of Luke chapter 2, where the, the angel choir began to sing, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Let's say that again. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. People will often say, what is God's will? There it is. There it is. God wills peace. God has goodwill toward humanity. This is the will of God. Well, how come things aren't that way? Because men have forgotten the first part of the verse. Glory to God. We don't put God first. We've put him last, third, fourth, fifth, 25th, and then we're shocked when there's chaos because things are out of order and things are out of sequence. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now read with me verse 3 of David's exhortation in Psalm 34. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. The first element of Christmas 
The first requirement for us to live fulfilling and fruitful lives as children of God is to learn to do that, to learn to magnify the Lord. Number one in your notes is magnify the Lord. You see, before you can glorify, you have to learn to magnify. I'm going to say that again. Before you can glorify, you must learn to magnify. Glorify is how you worship. Magnify is who you're worshiping and how you're seeing who you worship. In other words, if you ever, if you ever had your own life, maybe, maybe you're not this way, maybe you never get into the doldrums or, of, of your religious or spiritual walk, but I have on occasion. And whenever I find that my worship is, is, is not what it should be, whenever I'm just singing a song, Whenever someone gets up and, and they, the, the, the worship team or the choir or the orchestra play a song and we go, ah, you know, I'm tired of that song. I've missed the point. I've missed the point. If someone gets up and begins to play a song and it's, it's in a, a, a different style than I like and I just sit on my hands and go, I'm not, I'm not singing that. You've missed the point. If it has to be a certain way, if it has to be with a certain rhythm, if it has to be in a certain style, if it has to be in a certain uh, uh, pr- uh, procurement that, that is aesthetically pleasing to me, I've missed the point. Christmas is not about the lights, although the lights are beautiful. Christmas is not about the candles, although the candles are beautiful. Christmas is not about the tree, although the tree this year is stunning, isn't it? I mean, it's not about all of those things. All of those things are symbols to testify to something that is greater. What Christmas is about isn't about the, the, these symbols, isn't about the giving of gifts, it isn't about maximizing or maxing out your charge cards. None of that's Christmas. Christmas is about Jesus. Magnify the Lord with me. You see, beloved, we cannot glorify him until we have learned to magnify him. Glorify is how you worship, and we'll speak to that maybe today, maybe next Sunday. But you cannot properly worship what you do not see. David said, Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Magnify, magnify, magnify. What do you see, beloved? A.W. Tozer said this. The basic trouble with the church today is her unworthy concept of God. This is 50 years ago. The basic trouble with the church today is her unworthy concept concept of God. Our religion is weak because our God is weak. He's talking about the concept. Let me interject a statement there. Our religion is weak because our concept of God is weak. Christianity at any given time is strong or weak depending upon her concept of God. Let's stop there for a moment. Christianity right now is trailing in Western Europe. Christianity right now is trailing off in North America. But in Latin America and in Africa, it is accelerating. What's the difference? Has God changed? No. The concept of God among Western Christians is diminishing. Whereas in Latin American nations and African nations, the concept of God is magnified. Christianity at any given time is strong or weak depending on her concept of God. Tozer went on to say, I am positively sure after many years of observation and prayer, that the basis of all our trouble today in religious circles is that our God is too small. Again, let me interject with Tozer to give you context. 
The trouble is that our concept of God is too small. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. We have a God in our own eyes, a God we've created after our own image, our God who, who we, you know, we've almost wanted him to become Santa Claus. We say effective prayer is prayer that's answered the way we want. That's not effective prayer. Effective prayer is prayer that's answered the way he wants. And he'll never violate his own will. In religious circles, our concept of God is too small. Tozer went on. When he says magnify the Lord, he doesn't mean that you are to make God big, but you are to see him big. When we take a telescope, and look at a star. We don't make the star bigger. We only see it big. Likewise, you cannot make God bigger, but you are only to see him bigger. Hallelujah. My brother and God calls us to magnify him, to see him big. You and I do not change God by our perception of him. We change us. God is God. God is King. God is Lord Almighty. He is the living one, the holy one, the righteous one. The fact that you and I don't see him correctly is the cause of many of our troubles. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Oh, beloved, I, I, I have been earnestly waiting to preach this message to you because I'm so overwhelmed by the fact that I see God through too many filters of my own making. I see him through too many lenses of my own choosing. I see him through too many craftsmen of my own philosophical pinnings. I need to see the Lord God high and lifted up and his glory filling the house. He is not limited, but I've limited him. He is not hindered, but I've hindered him. He is not powerless, but I've caused his arm to be short. And understand what I mean by that. There were, there were times when Jesus' ministry, when he went into his hometown of Nazareth, and he was unable to do things because of their profound lack of faith. Had he changed? Not at all but the people were incapable of receiving because they thought he was the carpenter's boy. They'd heard about his ministry, but they knew him just as Jesus who grew up and played with his children, played with their children. They just saw him as, a, as another lad, as another young man, as another boy. They didn't see him high and lifted up. Oh, my friends, you and I have to see the Lord differently. You see, beloved, if you have a small God, then the giants in the land are too enormous. If you have a small God, the troubles are too many. The trials are too difficult. The tribulations are too unrelenting. If you have a small God, the conflicts are too violent. If you have a small God, the differences within our nation are too entrenched. If you have a small God, the battle is too hard. If Christmas is only a quaint, tender story of an impoverished couple looking for a room, as precious as that may be, then you're not seeing correctly. The prophet declared, Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Say those last four words with me. God is with us. Not a prophet with us. Not a president with us not a pastor with us, not a billionaire with us, not a celebrity with us, not anything of humanity that we tend to esteem far too highly, not any of those things. God with us. And this changes everything. 
The dictionary defines God this way. The supreme or ultimate reality. As the being perfect in power, wisdom, and goodness. Who is worshipped as creator and ruler of the universe. Theologians have defined it in various ways. God is eternal. Not eternal like you're eternal. You have an eternal soul. But you had a beginning point. My beginning point was in a long time ago now. Anyway, you have a beginning point. We see eternity this way. We see eternity as life without end. That's not how God's eternal. God is eternal in that he is not only life without end, he is life without beginning. From vanishing point to vanishing point, you are God. As far back as I can think, he is God. As far forward as I can think, he is God. There's not a moment in time. There's not a moment in day. There's not a moment that is beyond him. He is the eternal God. Heaven and earth may pass away, but not God. Men will rise and men will fall, but not God. Nations will come and nations will go. Kingdoms will come and kingdoms will go. Empires will come and empires will go, but not God. He is eternal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You and I are trapped in time. Time is a created physical property. You and I are trapped in it, so to speak, but not God. C.S. Lewis said, if you could imagine a piece of paper going into infinity in this direction and into infinity in that direction and into infinity this way and into infinity that way, if you could imagine a piece of paper that large, that infinite, that would be God. And then if you drew a line on that paper, that's time. He's Alpha. He's Omega. He's beginning. He's end. Before time was, he is. After time will be, he is. Hallelujah. He is not the great I was. He is the great I am. Hallelujah. There is nothing too hard. There is nothing too difficult. He is self-existent. You and I depend on the right mix of oxygen. You and I depend on blood pressure being right and glucose levels being right and oxygen being right and the world being tilted on its axis just right. We are dependent on all sorts of factors, not God. He's self-existent. He's self-sufficient. He's immutable. He does not change. Hallelujah. He is the Lord God. I change not. He is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is sovereign. He is infinite. He is boundless. He is transcendent. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is the Lord God Almighty. Oh, magnify the Lord. Hallelujah. He is pure. He is holy. He is why the heavenly worship sometimes is just diminished to holy, holy, holy. There's nothing else I can say. There's nothing else I can do. There's no other word I can ascribe. Hallelujah. 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 Again, Tozer said all that he is, he is without growth or addition or development. Nothing in God is less or more or large or small. He is what he is in himself. Without qualifying thought, he is simply God. Hallelujah. Jeremiah the Lord said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? If you don't see him right, then you think that this bill's too much. If you don't see him right, then you think this disease is too much. If you don't see him right, you think this tragedy or this trial or this tribulation is too much. But if you start seeing him right, you begin to see that no matter what may come your way, he is the Lord who will walk with you, walk through it, and be with you and sustain you through all things. I've grown a little weary of the selfishness that seems to be attributed with Christianity in the Western nations. We've tended to want God to serve us. We've tended to want a God who answered our prayer our way when we wanted it, how we wanted it. We gotten mad at him. 
We've gotten disappointed with him. We've gotten upset with him. We've gotten allowed a little calloused indifference to come into our own heart because God didn't do what we wanted him to do when we wanted him to do it and how we wanted it done. My friends, my beloved friends, that's not the God of the scripture. The God of the scripture is sovereign. The God of the scripture is holy. The God of the scripture is the great I am. The God of the scripture is so sovereign, so perfect, so pure, so holy that all my days are written in his book before one of them came to be. He knows everything about my life and every path I'm about to take. And he said, I will be with you. He's not my servant. I'm his servant. He's not my servant. I'm his servant. I need to see him more clearly. I need to understand him more thoroughly. Is there anything too hard for him? He is our king. He is our redeemer. He is our healer. He is our savior. He is our creator. He is our gift. Isaiah 9, 6, hope of all hopes, dream of our dreams. A child is born, sweet breathed. A son is given to us, a living gift. To us, say those two words with me. To us, again, to us, to us. To us, to us, hallelujah. God with us, given to us. Look again at the message of the messenger in our text, Luke 2, verse 11. A Savior has been born to you. Don't get me wrong. Jesus came for all humanity, but that announcement wasn't made in Herod's palace. That announcement wasn't made in Caesar's throne room. That announcement wasn't made in the place of the, the, the merchants and the, and the mercantile places and all those who were in the, in the middle of, of exchanging commerce. That place was made to a group of people who were way outside. Outside of life, outside of community, outside of society, kind of on the, on the outskirts. That was made to a group of shepherds who were in the, in the middle of the night watching over their flock. And angels went and found them. To you. To you. Because see, had that been in Herod's palace, they would have thought, well, of course, to a king. Had that been in Caesar's throne room, of course, to the emperor of the, of the known world. Had that been to the rich, well, of course, to the rich. Had that been to the high society and the religious leaders, well, of course, to the religious leaders. But God made sure that everybody knew, to you is born this gift. From the lowest of the lows to the highest of the highs to you, to you, in the middle of whatever is your pain, in the middle of whatever is your difficulty, in the middle of whatever is your frustration, your anger, your sin, your failure, to you today, to you, to you, to you, to you, a Savior has been born. God is with us. God is with you. This is vital for you to understand. Hebrews 13, 5. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Friends may abandon you. Loved ones may forsake you. You may not even be a good friend to yourself. But God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. This is, this is vital. You see, you're going to a table and you're going to take into your physical body elements. In the same way, it doesn't matter. There may be, you may be a, a millionaire, a billionaire. If you're, if you're a billionaire, you're kind of keeping that really good to yourself. But, uh, 
a millionaire, a billionaire. You may own businesses. You may run companies. You may work for others. You may be unemployed right now. But see, at the, at the Lord's table, just like at the foot of the tree and at the foot of the cross, it's level ground. And you'll take into your body an element and you'll take into your body the juice and you'll take into your body and everybody in this house that wills to will do that as well because we all partake of the same gift. We all partake of the same life. We all partake of the same hope. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter what your genetic background is. It doesn't matter where your family comes from. It doesn't matter any of these things. To you, to you, to you, to you, to you, to you, a Savior has been born. And God will never abandon you. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. It will not be him running out on you. You see, my friends, we think of King David often as the great worshiper. And of course he was. Many of our Psalms are written by him. But the great strength of David wasn't his worship. The great strength of David was that he saw the Lord correctly. I'll say that again. The great strength of King David wasn't his worship. It was that he saw the Lord correctly. Even early on, to magnify the Lord is not to make him larger, but to see him accurately. When teenage David faced Goliath, he did not deny the giant's size. He did not deny the ferocity of his sword and spear or the fierceness of his taunts. I mean, Goliath was Goliath. Goliath was a giant. Goliath was so ferocious that warriors trembled and no one would go out to fight him. When sickness visits your door, our faith does not require you to deny its existence. That's some strange mind over matter thing. When poverty may visit your life, our faith does not require you to pretend you're not in need. In fact, we would say just the opposite. Let your needs be known. James said, if there's any sick among you, call for the elders, pray. Let it be known. If you're in the middle of a trouble, a trial, a tribulation, our faith does not say, oh, deny it or pretend it doesn't happen. If you're in the mental battle right now, it, there, 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 there should be no, ostrac- uh, no, no sense of being ostracized by the church. Let's deal with it. Our faith does not deny that there are giants in the land. Our faith does not deny that there are battles to fight. Our faith does not deny that the enemy taunts and is vicious and cruel. But here's the key element that we've forgotten. Our faith says, but greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Our faith says, but greater is the Lord. Greater is the king. Greater is the God you serve than the poverty you might find yourself in. Greater is the God you serve than the illness you might be afflicted with in this moment or this hour. Greater is the Lord you serve than the demon that might be attacking your family. The Lord, your God, is greater. You see... When David faced the giant, and this was as a young man, barely beyond a, 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 the age of a child, probably a teenage boy. So young, so small that Saul's armor was too big. Didn't fit him. He, he wasn't a full-grown man yet. David didn't deny the giant. He ran up to him. David didn't pretend he wasn't there. He talked to him. 
David didn't cower back in fear. Not because he was so great, but because he knew his God was. Look at 1 Samuel 17. It'll be on your screen. It's also in your notes. This is David speaking to Goliath. You come to me carrying a sword and spear and javelin as your weapons. Hallelujah. There's no denial there. David even knew what the man had. He, he took assessment of all, the, of all the battle gear of the man. You know, well, let's see. I mean, you almost seem, well, well, there's a spear, there's a javelin, there's a sword, and this guy's bigger than me, probably twice my size. And uh, so I'm not going to box him. And I'm not going to throw a sword at him. I'm not going to throw a spear at him, rather. I'm not going to hit him with a sword, although he did use his own sword against him. But you come to me carrying a sword and spear and javelin as your weapons. Acknowledgement. But, hallelujah, hallelujah. But I come armed with the name of the eternal one, the commander of heavenly armies, the true God of the armies of Israel, the one you have insulted. This very day, the eternal one will give you into my hands. Stop pretending you don't have problems and start talking to them. Amen. Stop pretending you don't have battles and start talking to it. Amen. Stop pretending the enemy isn't assaulting you and start talking back to him. Stop pretending that the life you, you live is, is okay. I'm okay. How are you doing? I'm okay. You know, that's such a silly greeting. We, you know, and it, it's an American greeting. We need to understand that. We used to say hello. Now we say, how are you? And, and, and have you ever noticed, Reverend, that most people don't want to know? You shake somebody's hand and then you say, how are you? Or they say, how are you? And if you begin to tell them how you are, their mind goes, oh, no. <laughs> I didn't really mean that. Because it's just a greeting now. It's sort of like saying hi or hello. But we, we, we say, how are you? But the fact of the matter is most people are fighting something. Maybe I'm talking to the wrong room. <laughs> How many of you are fighting something? Okay. How many of you are fighting more than one something? You're on multiple fronts, amen? Okay, I got the right room. Okay. Scared me for a minute. I thought I'd wasted 40 minutes of my time and yours. All right. So we are fighting. We do fight, have battles. We do, have, we do live in an arena of conflict. We will have trials and we will have tribulation. Jesus said it would be like this. John 16, Again, in this world you will have trouble. In this world you will have tribulation. But take heart. Why? I've overcome the world. Magnify the Lord with me. When I face the battle, I don't face it with the knowledge that the battle is going to overwhelm me. I face the battle with the knowledge that the eternal one is with me. When I face the enemy, my only, you know, I'm getting old now. And I've come to a place in life where I'm not trying to do anything but the will of God. All I want is the will of God. All I want is God's will, God's way. If I have to fight a fight, I'm going to fight the fight. If I have to walk a battle, I'm going to walk in a battlefield. If I have to kind of lift my legs a little slower to get where I want to go, then I'm going to lift my legs a little slower, but I'm going to get where he wants me to go. All I care about is the will of God. And the only way for me to walk in the will of God is to lift him higher and see him correctly and more accurately. So when the giant of cancer or the giant of heart disease or the giant of this disease or the giant of that disease comes, when the giant of this enemy comes, when the giant of politicians opposing us comes, whatever the battle, I choose to see the Lord high and lifted up and his glory filling the house. Amen. And 
come what may. Come what may. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I do not have to have the result the way I want the result. I want the result now to be his result. We've gone through so many battles here, many of those unknown to you. Dr. Moncher and I and a couple others sitting in my office say, all we want is God's will. We'll fight the fight. We'll do whatever we got to do. We'll pay whatever we got to pay. We just want God's will for this place. tried to take that into my own life, into my own personal battles, into my own concerns and considerations. I need to see him large. I need to see him big. I need to see him glorious. I need to see him magnificent. I need to see him high and lifted up. David said, magnify the Lord with me. Goliath, you're big, but you're not bigger than him. You're strong, but you're not stronger than him. You got weapons, but you're not as weapon, your arsenal's not as big as his arsenal. I need to see him high and lifted up. When we see the Lord accurately, only then can we properly Glorify him. Only then. Only then. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. If your personal worship is dead and dire and diminishing and you need the right song, the right sway, the right words, the right tune, the right poem... You're not seeing the Lord the right way. I'm just telling you that. I'm just telling you that. I have met the Lord in places I didn't know he existed, even though I know he exists everywhere. But I've walked into a room unexpecting him and degraded by his presence. Magnify. Magnify. Magnify, magnify, magnify the Lord with me. Again, I'll refer back to Tozer. If our faith, if our religion, if our Christianity is weak, it is because our concept of God is weak. Floyd McClung Jr. was the international director of Youth with a Mission. Preached our church in Corona a long time ago now. But he made a statement that, I, that has echoed in my mind again and again. And before we go to the Lord's table, I'm going to share it with you. It was almost prophetic now as I look back on it. Because it's probably 25 years ago that he said it. And now we see the course of Christianity and evangelical circles with, an America, with America following this. He said, the problem with Christianity in America, because this was a missionary, remember, is that we have created a God in our own image and then bowed down to the idol we created. We have created a God in our own image. We even used to speak of it, an American gospel. Created God in our own image and then bowed down to the idol we created. You see, my friends, you'll have no peace if you're worshiping an idol. You'll have no peace, no wholeness, no sense of purpose if you're worshiping a God you created. Magnify the Lord. Get back to the God of the book. 
become people of the book again. Get back into the word again. Get back into the scriptures again. Get back to where you see him high and lifted up again. And you will walk and live in peace because that's God's will for you. That's God's will for you. So as we go to this table, as we begin this holy season, let us consider how you and I, individually and corporately, can magnify the Lord. Because if we'll magnify Him, then we'll glorify Him. And if we'll glorify Him, then we'll amplify His name. This is what the Lord's calling us to.